Um, we are so uh, blessed by the talent that we have in this community. We really are. Um, the band, the music team, our assistant and uh, staff ministers, our practitioners, we really are um, quite blessed. I feel like I'm hearing myself through more than one mic. Uh, so, Grand Rising, everyone. My name is Dr. Alice Reed, and I'm the spiritual director here at Centers for Spiritual Living. And um, there's more wonderful music coming this month. We gave you our wonderful uh, Jen Stackpole, who sang for you this morning. And uh, yes, <laughs> and next week we have uh, Gina Walker. Anybody here heard Gina Walker sing before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she'll be um, really bringing the goods on August 11th and joining us as our soloist. But not only that, she'll be joining us after the service around 12.30 for a workshop. And I want to get this straight. It's entitled, Elevate Your Energy and Praise and Raise Your Soul Frequency. Elevate your energy and praise and raise your soul frequency. And she'll be sharing practices with us that will help to um, first, ground us in, and get us centered, and then to elevate our energy from there, which is really the best way to, to be energetic and moving about the planet in this day and age, if we can center ourselves and ground ourselves and get balanced. And so I highly recommend, if you're feeling a little, oh, I don't know, like there's a lot going on in the world and you need to be a little more grounded, um, I highly recommend that workshop. I hope you'll join us for that. It'll be really, really terrific. We do have a new theme this month, and it is the unstatus quo. And um, Reverend Carla was accurate in that we are going to be looking at the things that are um, our, the status quo, the things that we're used to, the things that we've normalized. We're going to be looking at how... Um, that's not really, the, the, you know, the status. I don't know about you, but when I look around in the world, I'm not seeing a lot of status quo stuff. I'm not seeing a lot, a lot of stuff that feels the same. Um, you know, of course, I looked up the status quo, and it simply re talks about the current state of things. And um, like it or not, our status quo is being disrupted. And it's being disrupted by evolution. How dare you, evolution? <laughs> How dare you change? Um, I'm very fond of the saying that, um, I want to get this right, that change happens when the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Right? That's usually when we see things happen, even in nature. At some point, there's some energetic influx, and that energy can no longer be contained in the bud, and it must blossom. Or that blossom can no longer has the energy to keep it flowering, and so it dies away. There's always a movement of energy, and we humans sort of get attached to our status quo. We get attached to the to the things that we're used to. We get attached to comfort. We get attached to sameness. And what I'm, I'm noticing that in even, I guess it was like the last decade or so, and maybe it's, you know, this is always happening and it's just my turn to notice this at my, you know, as I have matured, but that there's just been a lot of shift in the world. There's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of people challenging what I'll call the status quo. I knew there was a problem with my mic. It's, there's another mic on. Can you make sure the other ones are off? Thank you. Yeah, there's, it, it's a little loud. I'm going to turn the volume down just a little. Thank you. Hmm. Where's my status quo mic? <laughs> Where's, where's the miking I'm used to? Um, <laughs> let's see. So, so what, I'm, what I'm seeing is that there's a, a shift in our world. And, and 
when I uh, look at this topic today, uh, and when I was thinking about the impact of othering, othering, that's not maybe a verb you use every day, is it? We, we're really talking about this idea of seeing people outside of ourselves, seeing people that are different than us, and having an experience that's unpleasant around people that are different to, than us, or people that have different opinions, or people who you know, want to live life differently. And so what happens sometimes, and oftentimes it's very unconscious, we other. We other all over each other. <laughs> we, we push each other away. And, and, and when I think about that, you know, there's... It's a paradox. You know, what a, we talked about paradox a couple months back. It's a, there's a paradox going on here. And that paradox is that we so want to be connected. We so want to have that experience of oneness that when we don't have that experience of oneness, we push away those that are in front of us that don't appear to be one with us. And then we create this cycle that instead of having connection, we have otherness. Instead of seeing the connection within each of us, we see the differences and we separate ourselves. And so it's, it's a um, paradox, if you will. And the only way to really deal with a paradox is through intention and consciousness, to be available to, you, to those paradoxes that come up for you when you want so much to have that sense of connection and then, golly day, you know, um, Jane is not giving it to you. I don't think I see Jane here today, so I think I'm okay <laughs> with, with that uh, uh, personification. Um, yeah, and so this, this, this verb, this action, this behavior of othering, we come by it honestly. And I think a lot of it's just human nature. And I, and I really want to focus on that that deep longing that we have for connection. Because that deep longing that we have for connection is really based in some part of us knowing at the most basic level of where we exist that we are one. That we are all connected. That, that we're so connected that there's no connection point. We're just all come from that one infinite reality that is out picturing and expressing itself through all of life. It's one of the main principles we teach in this particular philosophy. We teach this idea of oneness, that there really is no separation. And in order to describe oneness, we often describe what it's not. <laughs> you know, we, just, we describe separation, disconnection, discord. And there's a lot of discord going around right now. And, and I had an insight the other day, just kind of thinking about this idea of othering and, you know, looking at the sort of the grand landscape of, you know, at least in my lifetime, how we got here to this place right now where things feel a little bit in upheaval. I was watching some videos of the Olympics. There have been some amazing, amazing um, feats that people are doing, and it's so powerful to watch the athletes who are just, you know, they put everything into this one um, sports, whether it's gymnastics or um, whether it's some other kind of sport, they put so much of themselves into it and they give all of their heart and everybody's cheering them. So I've been watching a couple of those videos because it feels good to be, can, you know, I know a bunch of other people are watching this and, and I can have this kind of group experience of connection. And my device decided to, I was not paying attention through the transition, and my device brought up the next video. And there was Michael Jackson and Cher and the Jacks Five <laughs> singing a melody, you know, a, a, a bunch of melodies of the, of the Jackson Five in 1975 on some variety show. Now, I realize some of you weren't born in 1975. It wasn't that long ago, at least by my perspective. Um, and, I, and I was, it, 
it brought me back to this time when, at least in the U.S., we had three main channels. Three main channels, and we, and we watched, we only, had, you know, a lot of us saw the same thing. A lot of us were, you know, having these connected experiences. Did you know, did you see Laugh-In last week? Did you see, you know, this show? We, we had these common areas that we were living in, at least through the social media that we were working with. And, and right now, when I, when I, and I think it helped us to feel connected, I think it, you know, the sitcoms were, you know, it looked like our life. We, we saw these uh, situational comedies with uh, little vignettes of uh, people living their life in the world, and, and we would laugh at it, and, and it would help us to feel connected. If you were white, and if you were middle class, and if you were able-bodied, you felt connected. But if you weren't white, and if you didn't have all the trappings of the, the house and the car and the family, you might have wanted to feel connected, but didn't. And so when we look at this time in our in our collective culture of moving, uh, of uh, seeing ourselves, seeing ourselves outpictured in our entertainment, seeing ourselves outpictured in our news, seeing ourselves outpictured in the world around us, that helped us to feel connected. But if we're going to lean into this idea of the unstatus quo, if we're going to lean it excuse me, lean into this idea of truly evolving into the more beautiful life we know is possible, I think it's helpful to get a, a, a broader perspective. The other piece of media that came forward for me as I was thinking about this topic was um, a movie that came out in 1995, and it was called White Man's Burden. It was with John Travolta and Harry Belafonte, and it was an alternate picture of America. It was an alternate picture of what it would be like if white people were black and black people were white. And it was fascinating. There was, um, you know, everything was turned, everything was the same, the skin color was different. And I remember this one scene where John Travolta is home with his wife and his two kids in their lower-class neighborhood, and they're all watching TV, and they're sitting on the couch, and, and the, you see on the TV screen every scene, every show has, has black people on it. And you have this white family watching all these TV shows. Every commercial has black people in it living a very privileged life. And then as you look closer on the family, the white family that's sitting on the couch, the little girl is hugging a baby doll that's black. And it gave me this different purview that was not available to me until somebody drew a different picture. And I don't share this with you to, to shame anyone, but to really just help us to understand that there is a, we talked about it a little bit last week, there's a different perspective that we aren't aware of. You know, I like to say that you don't know until you know. And right now, as we are watching our world evolve, as we are watching the unstatus quo, as people are bringing forward different images to us of different ways of living and different lifestyles and different people, it's, it's, it's a little uncomfortable, even if it's an unconscious uncomfortableness, even if you're not quite aware of it, because the, the status quo is changing. We, as individuals, we're in this community because we choose to be conscious. We're in this community because we want to be awake and aware and alive. We want to be intentional with our lives. We want to be working with a living, breathing source that is always moving through us. And therefore, we have a little agency 
because we're practicing these principles, we're practicing the spiritual tools that are taught here in this community, we have a little agency to be able to navigate all this diversity that is coming our way and to see the beauty in it and to see the power in it and to begin to see that, that even though things are changing, there, there is still that principle of spirit in it. There is still that, those qualities of God in the world that is changing around us. The, the, the tricky part, I think, is that when in 1975, and maybe even in 1995, we had a sort of a lens that was pretty consistent with the three channels and, and the, the sitcoms we were all watching. And today, there's so many different points of view that get um, shared in the media. And that there are, in fact, that there are so many media connections that it's hard to feel connected. There are so many different voices that it's hard to see ourselves and ground ourselves in what's, what is our reality? What is the reality that we're dealing with? And this is where othering comes in. Because we're seeing a lot of othering. We're seeing a lot of difference. We're seeing a lot of different ways to live. We're seeing a lot of different ways to express ourselves. We're seeing a lot of different ways that God is individuating itself. Ernest Holmes talks about, he has this, this really nice quote that I found on a, on a blog from one of my colleagues, Dr. Jim Lockard. And Holmes writes, the first part's a little, a little heady, but the objective form to which we give our attention is created from the very attention which we give it. In other words, the experience we have is created from the attention that we give it. So in 1975, when we were all watching three channels, we were giving our attention to a lot of the same material. And therefore, we were thinking we were creating a world from that sameness that we were experiencing in our culture. And as our culture evolved, that, that picture, that lens, has been becoming larger. And it's been a little uncomfortable. It's been a little uncomfortable. So, so he talks about that, and then he goes on to say that life is a blackboard upon which we consciously or unconsciously write those messages which govern us. We hold the chalk and the eraser in our hand, but are ignorant to this fact. So we have some agency about how we want to experience what I think is a very organic, natural evolution of life that that our, our, our purview, if you will, the lens that we look through has expanded greatly in the last 40 years. We see all kinds of different ways of being in this world and it reflects the truth that we teach in, these, in this philosophy that th there is one infinite reality and it individuates. It individuates in, in millions of ways. And then our work, what do, we, what do we do with all that, right? Yeah, well, that's all very interesting, Dr. Alice. What am I supposed to do with that, right? Well, what we do with that is we ground ourselves in spiritual practice. We begin to get very clear about who we are, how we are individuating that amazing presence that is love and beauty and joy and freedom and power with. All those immutable qualities of God are moving and coursing through each one of you. And so we get really clear about ourselves so that that lens that we're looking through, it's clean. I've cleaned it up because I can see what I'm looking through. I can see the lens that I'm, that I'm looking at the world with. I can see what I might be tempted to other about as I move through the world. And as we, 
as we do that, as we ground ourselves in spiritual practice and spiritual principle, and we get clear on our authenticity, and we do the work that this philosophy so beautifully teaches us about principle, about being the most authentic individual and expression of God that we can, well then when an expression shows up in front of you that is really different, we know that that same thing is happening for that person. That connection that we crave often comes to us in what I'll call low-hanging fruit. It's, it's really easy to connect with some uh, event that's happening nationwide and to feel that connection with everyone as the Olympics are happening and you know various athletes and countries are garnering their medals and we're cheering them all on. It's easy to feel connected then. It's a little harder sitting at home, doing your spiritual practice, doing your deep breathing, doing that, whether it's meditation or chanting or journaling, it's a little harder to feel connected then. But all that you see outside yourself is that reflects connection is a reflection of a deeper, more intrinsic connection that already lives within you. So when you are walking through the world and you are seeing disconnection and you are seeing the unstatus quo and things feel like they're upside down, maybe it's you who are upside down. And it's okay. This is, this is how God creates. Things come about, they have a lifespan, They go away and something new comes forward. And as practitioners of this philosophy, your job is to stay awake for it, to be conscious of the change that's happening uh, in front of you and to respond with love because it's just, all it is is love expanding and expressing itself by means of each one of us. And there is, what is that saying? Normal is a setting on your washing machine. (laughs) There is no normal, unless you decide there is. You can certainly continue to hold on to your ideal of normal. You can certainly walk through life, you know, demanding that that's what you want to experience. There are some, quite a few people doing that in our world right now. They are demanding that things don't change. There's a group of, you know, if we look at the political landscape, I don't think I need to talk about parties, but there's a group that wants things to stay the same, and then there's a group that looks really split and divided because they all want things to change. And both groups want the same thing. They want deeper connection. And we go about it in different ways, and we go about it in some ways that are... Um, really lifting each other up, and we go about it in ways that sometimes divide us, oftentimes divide us. But the I am that lives in you, the I am that you come to a center like this to rediscover, to reconnect with, that I am, the world needs that energy. It needs you. It needs you who are willing to walk through this world being a conscious individual, responding with love, knowing that you are the best God that God could ever create as you, and knowing that everybody you come up with is in the same boat, an expression of God expressing itself through that individual. And when we can raise up our energy to that, we can weather any storm. We can weather any evolutionary change. We can, we can weather a new status quo. There's a, a large poster in our bookstore, and it's called The Global Vision, and each Sunday we give you a snippet of it. But that global vision really talks about a world that works for all. It talks about this world where we can really um, love each other, support each other, see each other. It's It's a world worth 
praying for. It's a world worth meditating for. It's a world worth journaling for. It's a world worth doing your sp spiritual practices for so that you can be that clear channel so that your lens is clear when you're at looking out about the world, so that you can respond with love, so that you can find that place where you see God no matter what. Because I got news for you. There are no exceptions. Everything is God in form. Some of it is really uncomfortable. Some of it is really, really hurtful. Some of it is really beautiful. Some of it is really joy-filled. And our job is to stay conscious and to stay awake and not to go to sleep, not to do the spiritual by bypass where we're so afraid to deal with uh, the whatever the heartbreak is that we see before us that we, we just we say, oh, there's a purpose for that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week but I really want you to question your status quo and your attachment to it and your willingness to lean into a world that works for everyone, your willingness to lean into the possibility of you and your fellow human being both being individuals with different ways of expressing themselves and, and, and not dehumanizing each other, but really being willing to get to know each other and love each other at a different level besides our opinions. We have a great opportunity here, folks. And so I, I, I thank you for, you know, uh, walking with me in this path of the unstatus quo. We're going to be looking at some hard topics, but I promise you we'll, we'll, we'll bring you to a soft landing. We'll, we, we might shake you up a little bit, but that sometimes the getting shook up a little bit is what's needed to let go of the status quo for the greater good that wants to be known. Thank you very much. Okay. So one of the things we do in this community is called um, uh, Affirmative Prayer and Spiritual Mind Treatment, and I'm going to do a, one of those right now for this this more beautiful world we know is possible. And so join me in knowing that the, the one power, that beautiful presence that is consistent in that it is joy and beauty and love and freedom and power with and creation and wholeness, that this power wants to experience that through each one of us. And so it knows us as beauty and love and wholeness and joy and power with and freedom. And so as we drink that in, that idea, that big idea that God is expressing perfectly as each one of us I know that our eyes are opened, our ears are opened, our heart is available. And we first ground ourselves in our truth and then we trust. We trust that cause is always creating by means of us. And we allow ourselves to be completely centered and grounded in those beautiful principles so that Love can walk the earth and joy can walk the earth and beauty can walk the earth as you, as I, as each one. And what I know is that kind of authentic living is, is contagious. So I claim right now that we contaminate everyone. That we allow ourselves to be that beautiful expression loud and proud and out loud, God in form, as me, as each one. And we keep holding on to that beautiful day when indeed we live in a world that works for all. It is a vision worth holding. It is a vision that we can be part of. And so it is with a surrendered heart and deep gratitude for the willingness of each one to 
be that place where God shows up that I simply anchor and let go of this prayer, knowing it is done, and together we say, and so it is.